Right. So the project comes from the fact that uh, a few years ago, I read Turing's paper called The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis, in which he showed how if you have an organism with two chemicals diffusing through the organism at different rates while it grows, with the property that when they interact, one inhibits the other, uh, you can get an enormous variety of patterns on the surface of the organism. You can have stripes, you can have dots, you can have groups of dots, you can have spirals and so on. And uh, there's quite a lot of mathematics in his paper, but if you want to read the paper, it was published in 1952 and it's been republished in various places, including most recently the book that I was asked to contribute to, where I, by mistake, got asked to comment on this paper. So when I read this paper, I was very impressed, as you might expect, Turing does amazing things, and I believe it's now his most widely cited paper, although most people in AI and philosophy don't know anything about it, because it's cited by biologists, and there are a lot more people in biology than there are in AI and philosophy. Anyway, um, I read this and thought, two years after this was published, Alan Turing was dead, 1954. What would he have done if he'd lived another 40 years? And I later discovered I wasn't the first person to ask that question. The other person was the one who um, wrote a book about Turing's life. Um, uh, he'd had a paper asking the same question. He, I discovered recently, he gave a totally different answer. I'm not going to tell you about his answer. I'm going to tell you my answer. My answer was that there's a pattern in Turing's work which involves showing that out of relatively simple structures and processes, you can get amazingly complicated things um, that are very surprising. And the work on Turing machines, which just have little simple marks on the tape and uh, a head moving along and uh, reading and writing and so on, you can end up proving complicated mathematical theorem, or rather having a proof of a com complicated mathematical theorem, or an answer to a complicated mathematical question produced. But he, he, that's just one example, and I think there are, there are others, but anyway, I thought, what would happen if he continued this, this trajectory? He might have tried to answer uh, another question. How can a cloud of dust give birth to a planet full of living things, as, as we have now with elephants and fleas and, and viruses and microbes and forests and all that stuff uh, covering the planet, and sometimes living peacefully, sometimes not, sometimes going extinct, sometimes spawning new groups and so on. I don't think this is very clear, but uh, this is supposed to show um, a cloud of dust which might condense into something. But if you, <clears throat> if you end up with a, a planet that's subject to physical forces, for instance, gravitational forces that make the dust condense and also do a lot of other things like producing uh, a very hot molten core, perhaps, and other things like the sun's attraction, which keeps this thing rotating in a, in a ellipt roughly elliptical orbit, and other things like cosmic radiation, and things like asteroids coming in, bashing from time to time. There's a lot of matter there behaving, and a lot of energy, um, but there isn't anything that we would call life initially, and nothing like chimpanzees and elephants and the viruses and, and oak trees and so on. But later, all these things, millions of them, and not just millions of individuals, millions of types of them are all over the planet in a very complex mutual dependency, collection mutual dependency and mutual antagonism relationships. And from some points of view, humans are a total disaster in the impact they have on everything else, but that's not going to be my topic for today. So the question is, how can you get there from here? Now, why should that be of interest to a conference on AI or um, uh, people studying intelligence, as opposed to biologists and philosophers and physicists and so on? Well, I got interested in AI um, 
nearly 50 years ago, 45 years ago or so, as a philosopher. My first degree was in mathematics. I then moved into philosophy, but through philosophy of mathematics, trying to understand the nature of, of mathematics as understood and discovered and learned and taught by humans. And uh, there were disagreements amongst philosophers and others about the nature of mathematics, which I'm not going to go into in any detail, but it might come up later, and if some of you want to, we can talk about that. And I had thought that there is something about what the philosopher Immanuel Kant had said about the nature of mathematics that was right, and the majority view amongst philosophers at that time was that Kant was wrong because he thought Euclidean geometry was something that we could really know was true in some way that went beyond empirical investigations and went beyond just logical deduction. He said we could know something about Euclidean geometry. But by then, by the time I was a student in the early, uh, late 1950s, uh, Euclid had been proved wrong because Euclidean geometry includes an axiom, the parallel axiom, which says that if you have any straight line and any point uh, in a plane with that straight line, in fact, given a straight line and a point, you could define a plane, then through that line there will be exactly, sorry, through that point there will be exactly one other straight line that doesn't ever meet the first straight line if, you, if they go on forever. In other words, there, there is a parallel line. Anyway, you could use that in many of the proofs. And um, then along came Einstein and said, no, we need a different sort of geometry in which that parallel postulate is false. And various philosophers have said, right, that shows that Kant is wrong about mathematics. And I think it just showed that Euclid's mathematics doesn't fit our world as precisely as was thought, but there's all the rest of Euclidean geometry and the topological structure in it that does fit. Now, I'm not going to go on at great length about the nature of mathematics and, and why I wanted to defend Kant, but except to say that I thought, not when I started doing philosophy, but after I met someone who taught me about AI and got me programming and so on, I began to think maybe I can work out how to build a baby robot that will grow up the way I think I grew up and all of you lot grew up not only being taught mathematics, but being able to make mathematical discoveries. You can be given problems, and uh, if you've had a decent education, you will come up with proofs of theorems in Euclidean geometry, and if you haven't had a decent education, I'm sure I could help you get one in, in an hour or two of private chat. But the, this used to be a standard part of the education of bright kids. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm probably spending too much time on, on that bit of it. The main thing was I thought my analysis of why Kant was right about mathematics and all the other philosophers I met were wrong in saying that Euclid had shown that Kant was wrong, left me unsatisfied. I felt I haven't got it right, I haven't filled in enough details. When I started learning about AI, I thought maybe I can design a baby robot that will learn mathematics, start making its own mathematical discoveries, do what must have been done by our ancestors before Euclid, namely make entirely new discoveries in mathematics. And if I show what you have to put into this baby robot, to, do, to replicate that aspect of human history, I will have shown what Kant was trying to get at. So I got into AI, and I learned to program, and I interacted with lots of very clever people. I spent a year in Edinburgh where I met Alan and had my brain rewired, not only by Alan, but other people taught me a lot about AI. And I went back and I worked on various projects with colleagues and I'm, I've been working since then with colleagues and I still haven't worked out what we have to put into this baby robot to make it grow up, to make the discoveries that I suspect everyone in this room could make if suitably stimulated or could have made when you were younger. And maybe some of you did without realizing it because your teachers or parents didn't realize what you'd done. That also happens. So um, my attempts to understand those things took me in all kinds of different areas in AI. I spent a lot of time on vision, partly because it's interesting and a real challenge, 
but partly because I thought, as Kant had said, that there's something about our ability to see or our ability is more generally to perceive spatial structures and so on that was connected with the, the ability to make those mathematical discoveries. There are blind mathematicians, but they have brains that are products of evolution we, and their ancestors could see. We don't, as far as I know, have any human lineage like blind mice or something that started from some simpler kind of organism and have always been blind. So human beings born blind almost certainly have a lot of the neural mechanisms that evolved for sighted mammals. Similar things are in birds, so it's not just mammals, but birds came along a different trajectory and some of that stuff might have been rediscovered by evolution. Anyway, so um, I feel there must be something there. I don't know what it is. I've been working on vision. I've been working on AI. I've been talking to people, learning about various kinds of AI systems for natural language understanding, for problem solving, for making plans. And I don't see anything that looks like the ability to make those discoveries in Euclidean geometry and so on. So when I asked this question a few years ago, in fact, it must have been about 2011, when I was asked to write this paper and I'm wondering what can I write, I thought, well, maybe I can propose a project, which is what Turing would have worked on, which would try to fill in gaps between the dust cloud and the molecules and what we have here but with a special slant. There are lots of people working on that and have been for a long time. There are lots of people working on changes in the genome. There are lots of people working on changes in the morphology, the development of skeletons, the development of different lineages. For instance, plants didn't always exist. Uh, and when they did, they had to have new kinds of mechanisms, for instance, a new kind of material to enable something to stand up upright, um, uh, rooted to the ground. So there are people working on all those things, but what I think Turing would have worked on was what were the forms of information processing at the, at the very earliest stages and what kinds of transitions could there occur in information processing? What's information processing? Well, it's getting some kind of structure, pattern or whatever, which can be used to control actions, decision making or whatever. Um, a lot is known about biological information processing, and in particular is that there's been a huge amount of work on how genetic information is encoded in DNA, and uh, a huge amount of work on the kinds of mechanisms for replication that make use of DNA. And DNA came relatively late, there, were, clearly, there weren't things uh, using DNA initially. Um, there might have been simpler things, yeah? Um, I don't know what Turing knew. Everything I say about Turing is speculative, but by 1942 they had not yet, uh, Watson and Crick hadn't done their work. Sorry, by 1952 when he died, I don't think he could have known about what they had done. Um, sorry? I don't know when Watson and Crick published their paper. It was, it was in the early 50s. Actually, if it was 1950, he might have, but this paper was, published in 52, so probably most of the work had been done. And he had been interested in life. It was clear from things his mother knew. For instance, there's a picture by his mother of Turing looking at daisies, holding a hockey stick, and there's a hockey match with, his, with boys in the background who are continuing with the game or something. And um, there's a letter which I only discovered recently which he wrote to um, uh, a well-known scientist whose name I've forgotten, I, I've got these, if you want to know you can email me and I'll send you the details, where he's trying to persuade this person who was setting up some experiments to use Turing's design for a kind of computer to do some experiments in biological modeling, says Turing. 
And in this letter he says, and I'm much more interested in trying to use computers to understand the biological processes than for engineering purposes or, so, or whatever. So that, I didn't know that when I wrote, when I formulated this conjecture on what he would have worked on, but I had clues that those were his interests from various things I'd read and half remembered and so on. Anyway, so trying to understand what the intermediate stages in information processing are would add to what other people are doing. They're looking at a lot of the biochemistry involved. There's also an awful lot of work on changes in morphology, changes in behavior, changes in environments. Um, but information is a constant theme in life. There has to be, uh, because anything that is alive has to use information to keep alive. For instance, it has to use information about getting food. It has to use information, for instance, if it's got a temperature range within which it can keep alive, and if its own internal temperature drops below that or goes above it, it might die. And if it um, is in an environment where there are external temperature, temperature changes, uh, homeostatic mechanisms long before the Watt governor, which controlled the speed of a steam engine by using feedback loop, biological organisms were using negative feedback to control, to maintain bodily states within certain ranges. Um, and that could include releasing energy at a, at a rate, you know, from chemical stores at a rate to compensate for changes in the temperature and the external temperature. Um, other things to do with controlling what kinds of chemicals that come into contact with the outside of the organism are allowed in if the, organ if the membrane can be controlled to open up and let some things in or to let some things out, waste products and so on. So information is used to allow resources like energy and material structures to do things that are required for the ongoing uh, life and or intermediate uh, benefits of an organism, right from the very simplest organisms. But the types of information and the types of mechanisms and the types of purposes for which information are used change. And there may already be someone who's done a systematic in study of all the varieties of information processing in living things, but if so, I haven't come across it. <coughs> now, um, the task is almost impossible because most of the forms of information processing in the earliest uh, stages of biological evolution almost certainly have left no records. Information processing is a kind of abstract feature of the way of what's going on. There might be records showing structures of little organisms. In fact, there are lots of records showing the shapes and maybe something about the environment of the organisms. But the kinds of things they did and how they did them, that's lost. So this project, to try to find out what all the intermediate stages are, is going to have to have an awful lot of guesswork. But of course, you can have totally blind guesswork and you have informed guesswork. And the informed guesswork can make use of a variety of sources of information. One being our ability as engineers to understand the problems, engineers and scientists and so on, to understand the problems that various sorts of organisms might have had which required use of information to control temperature, for example, control osmotic flow, to control movement, towards good things, away from bad things, and so on. Later on to control finding mates, finding food, then trying to escape while you're trying to eat it, and so on. So we can use a lot of what we know about the requirements for life to try to work out kinds of in, uh, the need for kinds of information processing that we will never be able to get direct evidence for. We can also get indirect evidence because Many of the, the things that are still alive now are very, very simple life forms. There are many things between single-celled organisms and elephants uh, and giant fungi that are you know, tens of meters long and so on. So 
there are, there are still on this planet a huge variety of things. So by using the evidence that there still is, plus a lot of intelligent interpolation, and guess what, we might be able to come up with examples of types of information processing. And then we can start asking questions about what sorts of evolutionary changes could have got from this stage to that stage? What sorts of advantages and disadvantages might there be? Now, what's all that got to do with AI? This is the conjecture, which may be totally false, but there are people who say there's things that, are, that brains are doing that we don't know about. And that's why our machines aren't as intelligent as human beings in various ways, despite the apparent successes like cars drive, um, like robots, machines driving cars and various other things, even doing surgery. Um, despite all those successes, there are all sorts of things humans can do that uh, animals can't, uh, that, that, that these machines can't, including uh, making the sorts of mathematical discoveries that I'm going to say more about but also um, um, creating musical compositions, writing poetry, but more interestingly, enjoying musical compositions, enjoying poetry, uh, sh sharing jokes, and so on. So there are lots of things that should be within the scope of AI that we don't seem to be very close to, at least that's how it looks to me. Uh, some of the people who are making large strides in certain narrow directions sometimes don't notice all the things their systems are not doing. Now, I in particular have been thinking, as I said, since the early, w w well, I did my, um, P my DPhil, uh, which was, was finished in 1962, and then later when I met Max Clues and started learning about artificial intelligence in 1969, and on and off since then, been trying to think about how to get machines to do the kinds of, make the kinds of geometrical discoveries that that Euclid could make and we can make, and I'll maybe give some more examples soon. And it just seems to me that we're a long way off from that. That we have computers that can do very complicated algebraic and logical reasoning. Those kinds of reasoning fit very well on digital computers. In fact, in part, that's because that's what they were designed to do. But the sort of reasoning uh, that I haven't yet illustrated for this group uh, that was part of Euclidean geometry and which young children seem to be able to do and some other animals, seems to me we're not close to. And I think that's connected also with huge differences between animal perception and perception of robots. And I spend quite a lot of time interacting with people in robotics, and I've worked a bit on vision. So the hunch is maybe there's just some type of computation we haven't noticed. And, and we're not trying to build it. And it may even not fit well on computers. That's an open question. There may be things that just can't be made to run on a particular kind of substratum. They might need something that is there in brains and on computers. People have made claims about that. For instance, there are people, uh, some of you may know the writings of Roger Penrose and um, Stuart Hameroff, who say there are things going on inside neurons in things called microtubules, which are much smaller than neurons, which make crucial use of quantum phenomena, non-local interactions and superpositions and collapse, quantum collapses and so on, which don't have any analogs in our normal digital computers. Um, and they try to argue that, in a way that I find totally unconvincing, that somehow there's a direct link between those special features of microtubules and human consciousness and the ability to understand Gödel's theorem. Some of you may have come across debates linked to incompleteness theorems. By the way, does anyone need me to explain what an incompleteness theorem is? I don't mind. Say, either you're bashful or you're well educated, maybe both. Um, anyway, so the, I'm not going down the route of those people saying there's this huge gap because we can see that Gödel's theorem is true, but now machines can't do it because Gödel's theorem is true and says they can't do it or something like that. 
So we'll make them conscious, give them microtubules and quantum mechanics. Will do it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there might be all kinds of other intermediate cases between the sorts of control processes that we already know that can happen in chemically controlled systems in bodies, um, including, for instance, replication of uh, molecular structures, which are part of the processes of growth of an organism, and also processes of reproduction, but also generally things like repair when there's damage, something detects that you're damaged and then has to repair it, they have to replicate structures um, that, have been uh, that have been damaged. So we know about lots of things going on. And people are beginning to model them on computers. This is happening more and more. I expect in Edinburgh there are lots of biologists are modeling processes required for explaining uh, the development of cancer cells, for example. Or modeling processes where certain kinds of drugs interact with cancer cells. So there's a lot of that going on. But it's um, not clear that everything that's relevant to the chemical processes is being modeled. Uh, and I don't have very precise suggestions. One thing that is different about chemistry is that it's both discrete and continuous. Discrete insofar as when you form, when a chemical bond forms, that can become very stable and resist all kinds of thermal buffeting and so on. And you can have catalytic processes where bonds form and one bond forming triggers a process where the, something changes and that causes another process. So you have triggered discrete events of the sort that you can also have in computers. But while that's going on, structures may be folding, coming together, moving apart, and in the course of doing that, altering the operations, altering the opportunities for these chemical on-off discrete processes. So maybe there is something in that kind of, of um, chemistry that's used both during the development, reproduction of a cell, development of brain, development of the nervous system, uh, digestion, repair, um, metabolism, and so on. There might be things going on there that either we haven't replicated on computers, or it can't be done for some reason, or it can only be done uh, with massive resources that w we wouldn't be able to fit into feasible computers. Um, but, or there might be something else, for instance, something like quantum, quantum non-locality playing a role, and there are people who are producing evidence that that goes on. I'm keeping a completely open mind about what there is, just saying, if we look for all the kinds of things going on, or that might have gone on between the simplest organisms and what we have now, looking at intermediate stages we know about, things like, uh, other mammals that have some sort of intelligence, but different from humans. Things like other lineages, not mammals, but um, uh, birds. There are very intelligent birds, as you, you probably will know. I may get around to showing some videos. But also quite different things, where there are um, microbes doing things. It may well be that if we find all, lots more varieties of biological information processing, we may discover something that's playing a crucial role in human brains and has never been noticed. Because there are lots of things you don't notice, either because you're not looking for them, or B, because you don't have the technology to notice them, or C, because you don't have the theoretical apparatus required to describe them. So there are at least three different reasons, maybe more why there might be important things going on in systems as complex as brains that we haven't found and may play a role in, in, in human and elephant and squirrel and, and orangutan intelligence. So one way to try to find them is just to keep studying brains. But of course brains are very, very complex things with all sorts of things happening in parallel interacting and it may just be that it, we cannot unravel that using any of the kinds of research methods that are available to us. 
But if we can find intermediate cases in the evolutionary history where they were not yet raveled up together, we might say, what's going on here? This is strange. How does it do this? And discover something which has interesting properties, interesting information processing properties, and then ask, and usually there will have to be some extra reason for asking this question, could that be happening at this stage in the development of a neural, a neural system, or at this stage in the operation of a synapse, or at this stage in something else going on in the brain? Um, so that's the, the conjecture, that there might be things we could learn by studying um, how we got from this protoplanetary cloud to where we are now. And the rest of this has to be about some of the intermediate stuff that has to happen to make the evolution that I'm talking about possible, which if we, if we think about it, will give us insights. And that's construction kits. But before I talk about construction kits, there must be people who want to raise objections or ask questions or provide examples that I haven't thought of that are relevant. Any, any, anyone want to contribute or? No, okay, well, either I've succeeded in numbing your brains or um, you need more time to think about these questions. So, this talk was advertised as being about construction kits. Can I go back? Evolved construction kits for building mines. <coughs> now, what's a construction kit? A construction kit is some apparatus that's got bits of stuff that can be assembled in various ways and which enables new kinds of apparatus to be constructed with new properties, typically. Um, but there will be constraints on what you can build with any particular construction kit. Now, I wonder how many people in this room played with Meccano kits ever as a child? Okay, a few. Okay, and I'm glad to see it's not only males. Um, I think that was one of the most important parts of my own education between the ages of five and ten, starting with very simple Meccano and adding more. Meccano, at that stage, didn't have any computers, as they, they probably do now, but it was bits of metal, strips, plates, and so on, with holes, and then you got screws and, and nuts and bolts, so you could put two of these things together, put a, nut and a screw through the hole, and a nut at the end, tighten up, and then you have two things joined to form a larger thing. You could also put rods through holes and attach things into the rod, and you could have some structure with this rod going through, and then the things could rotate. You could have strings and pulleys and hooks going up and down and so on. Later they added wind-up uh, clockwork motors, which so you could drive around, gear wheels and other things. But um, there are many other kinds of construction kits. Uh, some of you may have met Tinker Toys. Anyone met Tinker Toys? Tinker toys made of bits of wood, uh, circular bits with holes in them of different sizes and uh, circular cylinders, cylindrical pieces of wood. And when you stuck the piece of wood into uh, some of the holes, they would fit tightly and so you'd have a new structure with a piece of wood and a knob on the end. And the knob on the end would be itself a, a thing with more holes so you could stick more things in. And, but other holes were, were bigger, so if you put the, the rods through them, you could have so you rotate it. So you could have a framework made of um, relatively rigid structures uh, made of uh, bits of wood and these wheels, and then something going through lined up holes and wheels at the end, you could roll it along and be a, something like a little trolley or something. Fisher Technik, anyone? <laughs> Came from Germany, as you can probably guess. And, and there are lots more, I think. There are probably lots more than I know. But even paper dolls, which my sisters used to play with, uh, they'd cut out bits of paper and then they'd rearrange them in various ways and they could assemble them. Um, things you can do with paper folding. Any of you do origami? Okay, at least one. 
And uh, that's a, a very interesting sort of construction kit because it doesn't look like a construction kit. You just get a sheet of paper. It's not a kit. It's not got lots of bits and pieces that you bring together and so on. But actually it has. They're just all connected in this sheet of paper. But there were things you can do with it. And when you, once you fold a, a sheet of paper, unlike a sheet of cloth or cling film or whatever, uh, you get a new structure which has various constraints on what you can do with it. If you fold a sheet of paper, you can make a, a sort of upside down tent and you put it on a table and, and you'll have this tent with a tunnel through it. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that with cling film. So constructing kits are made of things that can be manipulated, rearranged. The, the, they're made of kinds of stuff with different properties like the difference between paper, wood, metal, cling film, and so on. Plasticine, something else, where you've got the kind of stuff that uh, is much more variable than any of the other things that I've mentioned previously. You can stretch, twist, push it together so it merges again. Uh, and you can make things out of plasticine. So construction kits provide, each sort of construction kit has a space of possibilities that grows out of it that can be done with it. Uh, what's in that space will depend on how much of the kit you've got because sometimes you may need thousands of parts of, of, a, of a Lego kit or a oh, Lego's one I hadn't mentioned previously uh, or Meccano or Tinker Toy Kit to make a certain sort of structure whereas other things can be made with ten or five or, or two parts and so on. Um, why am I talking about construction kits? Well, you're going to do us a nice demo of origami? Okay. Because um, it's clear that at various stages in evolution, there were different construction kits. Initially, there was physics and chemistry. Molecules with the properties I was talking about earlier, that they can come together and come apart and they can get involved in chemical reactions and they can fold and change the shape and so on. They can form structures like membranes which are not rigid, um, slightly elastic, and can allow liquids through and so on, allow some molecules to go through, others not, can allow different molecules to go in different directions. Um, but the kinds of construction kits that are used by biological organisms have changed. Uh, a dramatic change that um, I discovered was an interest of a biologist at my university, Birmingham, Juliet Coates, who happened to have a father who was a linguist who was one of the people I knew at Sussex. Anyway, she's studying, uh, trying to understand what kind of new construction kit was required to enable plants first to grow vertically. Um, previously, there were things that swam around and crawled around and grew horizontally and went through soil and whatever. But to have something that can grow upwards, for instance, to get sunlight, to get whatever it is, uh, to project its spores, uh, requires different kinds of material structures. Is it lignin that's the crucial thing to the strength of, of plants with wood and so on? And furthermore, it's not just strong. It can be very strong. You can have giant redwood trees and, and hurricanes blowing, and some of them don't fall over. They, they may give a bit, but, and they have huge weights they support. And of course, humans have made use of that strength in a lot of their constructions over the centuries. Um, there's a huge variety of types of physical materials that are essential for, for living creatures of different sorts. In humans, there's bone, obviously, which is partly like what you need for trees and partly different. Bones tend to be rigid. Uh, they don't bend in the wind and so on. Uh, but also, there are different weight-strength ratios because um, there's a lot of motion that animals with bones do that trees don't need to do. And if you're your rigid parts are too heavy, then you need too much energy and so on to get around. Uh, or you, you, that limits what you can do. Uh, there are tendons which uh, can be used to transmit a force around a bend when you move your fingers. 
there are not a huge amount, number of muscles there, all each joint controlled by muscles, as can happen in other parts of the body. But there are muscles in other, uh, further along, and they, there are tendons pulling things. And in fact, some roboticists have tried to make robot hands based on that, uh, built on that principle. And it seems to me that that's the only sensible way to build hands instead of having heavy motors all over the end of an object that's going to be moved around and so on. Um, Evolution is a brilliant engineer. So there are many kinds of construction materials and construction mechanisms that make use, that create these materials, that assemble them, that put them together, that bring different sorts of things together like bone and tendon and muscle and skin and blood vessels and so on, all doing different jobs. Uh, probably using properties, biological properties, that evolved at different times in our history. Maybe some of them might even have evolved in different lineages and then were brought together. That can also happen in evolution. Um, although you wouldn't think that from popular expositions of Darwin's theory. I think it was Lynn Margulis who emphasized the importance of evolution not being a tree structure, but more of a network structure where things can merge as well as branch out. Okay. But anyway, that's a digression. <laughs> so if you've got construction kits, then you can, you can make things. And if you create a new construction kit, you can make new things. And if you put construction kits together, you might be able to make things that neither could make on their own, like um, uh, computers and Lego. And then you have computerized Lego robots and so on. Right, so if we want to understand the information processing at various stages in evolution, it might be useful to know something about the sorts of construction kits that can be used to build information processing systems and also to link them up with other things like the materials, the bones and muscles and so on. Um, what kind of construction kit is available? Well, initially, it's just whatever physics, physics and chemistry provide. And in some sense, you can say, well, that's all you need, because that's all there was, and look what came out of it. But in another sense, that's the wrong answer, because new construction kits as I have indicated, for instance, in connection with the requirements for plants and other things, new construction kits were required, admittedly built out of this original physical construction kit, which I call the fundamental construction kit. The new construction kits made new things possible in what you might call a relatively straightforward production processes relatively fast production processes, whereas if you were constantly having to start from the physical materials, uh, everything would just be much more laborious, would take much longer and have to be constantly, you'd have, constantly have to reinvent and rediscover things that, are, that had previously been used. So being able to take something that's been developed that can be used to build something and then reuse it and replicate it, explicitly replicate it in that form as a something to be used, then you can, as a history of human technology shows clearly, we don't, our modern engineers do not have to start where our cave people, ancestors started in order to um, build the things they build now. They're constantly using things that were built in previous generations and previous centuries and so on. And evolution does that too. Right. Anyone want to raise any questions, objections? Yes? Uh, there seems to be a dichotomy between construction kits as materials or construction. It seems to be uh, a, a dichotomy. Like, on one hand, you talk about construction kits as uh, like material stuff. On the other hand, you, you started with the information processing yes. uh, <coughs> building blocks. So <coughs> is there a connection or? And these two different things. Yeah. And, and you're quite right to point that out, because amongst biologists, 
the importance of construction kits, both for materials, but also combinations of different sorts of materials in larger structures, that has been very obvious. And there's, been, there's a lot of work on that. But construction kits for information processing, the need for construction kits for information processing is not so obvious. It's not the sort of thing that you learn about in biology, except for the very basic kind of stuff that's taught about the need for DNA and the information processing that's required for replication. And maybe some other, a few other things as well. Some of them, for instance, who start studying psychology and so on will start thinking, well, we need some apparatus for getting optical information about the environment or tactile information or other things. And so the need for information processing comes in there. But trying to see it as a, as a, as a whole and trying to teach people to think about information processing as something that pervades biology and takes many forms, requires many sorts of construction kits, as far as I know, is not part of any agenda. If I am, then I'm just scrabbling in the sand when there are other people who have already made all the progress that <laughs> I'm talking about. But if it hasn't been done, then clever people are needed. Now, in some sense, isn't the notion of a construction kit uh, the notion of hierarchical structuring? That is, you're building things that are productive of higher level compositions. And then the question comes, um, information, things that manipulate information, um, live on a substrate of physical objects. And so information transmission is accomplished by, through transitions of the states of some physical objects. And so it would seem that um, if you were evolving a population of um, physical construction kits, things that lent themselves to physical hierarchical structuring, one of the things that would make a difference in the fitness or the virtue of uh, a particular physical construction kit would be that it would naturally, because of its physical nature, simultaneously transmit information or convey information, store, manipulate, and transmit it. So that, in fact, it's not actually correct that the information construction kit and the physical construction kits are separate, but that the information processing construction kits are kind of, um, I hate to say parasitic, because I hate to think of all of us as being parasites on the molecules, but it's... Yes. And they think about half of what they're talking about, yes. but not the other one. So I think oh, increasingly that's changing. But the biologists who think about information processing have mostly not studied AI. So they don't know anything about mechanisms that can handle grammatical structures. They don't know about things that can make mechanisms that can make plans or the mechanism for things that can learn. Well, then the, some of that comes in the studies of the immune system sorts of learning. So we need this study to be highly interdisciplinary because different sorts of questions get asked at different stages of the research. Um, our break's supposed to be at 3.30, is that right? It's not 3, yeah, okay, so I can carry on a bit longer. Um, I'll now make a confession which you probably uh, have already spotted. I haven't a clue where I am in my planned collection of talks and I'm just going to see whether they skim through some of my things in this material. Everything I write eventually goes into things on my web page. Uh, unfortunately, it's not well organized. Um, but if you Google any phrase I've used today, you'll probably find that it has come up in various things. Oh, I remember where I was. I was about to start saying there are different sorts of construction kits. And um, uh, that's one of the kinds of things that we can um, elaborate on a little. Now, is that in here or shall I just do it off the top of my head? Um, oh, well, since I've got that, I'll just pause on it. Apologies to people who heard me in the math seminar this morning. This is a video of a 
17 and a half months, it's actually a GIF image extracted from a video, a uh, 17 and a half months child who just before this was crawling along holding a pencil and she saw this sheet of paper with a hole. She picked it up and uh, start, she poked it through, she pulled the pencil out, she then bent the paper back, so start again, push it through, pull it out, bend the paper, poke it through from the other side, pull it out, bring it back and poke it in again. So in, out, round, in. She clearly, she wasn't in, interacting with anybody. I just happened to have a camera there and I, I got that little piece of information. Um, she wasn't engaging with the people around her. There were a few other people in the room, but she was just intent on that. And that's something, if you look carefully at lots of children, and I think some other species, you'll find they just get triggered to try something in the environment. I call it architecture-based motivation. There's something in the information processing system that when it perceives certain things, causes an internal reflex to create a motive, do so and so. Not because the individual thinks, I'm going to get some reward out of this. I will answer a question, I will learn something, whatever. It's just, move that. So if you see a child who walks along, sees a lamppost, and when they come to the lamppost, put the hand on the lamppost, go around three times, and then walk on. I suspect that's an example of what I mean by um, the architecture, triggering a reflex to create a motive. If there's some other motive, of course, that's already there, like to get that ice cream further down the, uh, the, the road, uh, that may win, and this new motive to, uh, to uh, go around the lamppost may not be acted on. If there's a tin can on the way and they see it and then uh, there's a new motive to kick it, that, one might, that motive might be acted on because it's not going to slow down the journey to the ice cream van. So, so I think one of the kinds of things about information processing is that information processing mechanisms not only provide answers to questions, they can also pr provide goals, and they can provide them in many ways. And a lot of researchers assume that all the mechanisms that provide goals have to come from anticipated rewards. And I think that's just false, and we have to understand the variety of ways in which evolution plus patterns of development in young children cause uh, kinds of motive generating mechanisms to add something to some ongoing collection of motives which then will compete with other motives and may in many cases not get anywhere. Um, there's something else about that case. In order to do what she does, I mean there's no messing around, no trial and error and failing to get the pencil through like your typical robot going through its training phase. phase. Well, somebody's typical robot, I don't want to offend anybody here. Um, she sees it, the goal is formed, she carries out one action, it looks as then as if the next goal then is triggered. I don't believe she's started off with the goal of pushing the pencil through, putting it out, pushing it to the other side, pulling it out and then pushing it through again. I mean, she might have done, but that just seems bizarre and it doesn't seem to fit the kind of thing I would expect to come out of evolution in a baby human, might in some other animal. But um, even if it does, it would just be an example. But in, in either case, whether it was a triple goal from the start or one goal then another goal then another goal, in each case the goal specified some process in which spatial relationships were altered. And in that case, it's not a trivial process, uh, specification. I mean, try to describe in English exactly what her goal was. Well, you might at some level of description uh, find it fairly easy. But there's no reason to believe she could use any language like English at that age. She was still, as I said, 17 and a half months, uh, able to understand simple sentences, maybe could produce one or two words at a time, but something like, put the end of this pencil through that hole, push it in, and then put it out. It was certainly not something that was part of her communicative repertoire, but it seems 
if you watch many animals, not just humans, a lot of animals, intelligent birds, squirrels getting the nuts from a squirrel-proof bird feeder, if you, any of you have tried to stop squirrels getting nuts in the garden, you know what I'm talking about. Or you can go to Google and type squirrel defeats bir squirrel-proof bird feeder. You get lots of videos of intelligent squirrels creatively finding a way to do things. Anyway, they almost certainly don't talk English or American or Urdu or Swahili or any other human language. And yet they seem, at the time they solved that problem, to have worked out what to do and to do it with some clear anticipation of what they're going to do. In our case, um, I've got a picture, or rather my wife took a picture of a squirrel that had seen um, a bird feeder hanging in the middle of a pane of glass about that high off the ground. And on either side of the pane of glass, there were thin plastic frames. So this was a patio door that could, sorry, this was a fixed patio door. The other side of it slid open. And this squirrel worked out that it could climb up the side of the patio door, even though there's only about a half an inch thick sort of bit of plastic that frame to grasp, but nevertheless, and nothing like climbing up a tree where you can get your claws right around the thing. It was able to climb up to a position where it was roughly at the same height as this tray suspended with seeds in it, suspended on the, in the middle of the pane, launch itself sideways, land on the tray, and that's where my wife got the picture. Um, now, what form of representation of the process that it went through what was there in its brain when it started at the ground? Um, how much did it know about the details of what it would have to do? How far was it able to work out that the differences between this thing and all the other things it had been climbing could be overcome, provided it controlled its movements in the right sort of way? And then at the end, working out the complicated sequence of muscular signals, control signals, to, to launch itself at the same time as letting go uh, to move in the appropriate direction to land on the track. I, I don't know. But anyway, the only, the only point I'm laboring here is that a lot of human and animal motivation and planning and plan execution seems to be going on without any evidence of use of anything like human language, but with an obvious requirement for something that, at least up to a point, has features that are common to human languages, namely that there are components, there are relationships, they can be assembled to form larger structures, which themselves can be assembled to form larger structures, and these can control actions. And presumably, they're also part of the content of the percepts, the perception of this thing up here, that thing along to the left, the place where you can grip it, the kind of initial motion re needed, and so on. So uh, there's something in brains that probably goes back long before human languages played a role in, that, but played a role in perception, in planning, and in control and execution of action, and still goes on in pre-verbal humans, um, and also in other intelligent animals. But what it is, it's very hard to work out. I don't think there's anything coming out of neuroscience that suggests what's going on in her brain. Or what's going, I mean, the people might say, oh, it's mirror neurons or something to explain things. But they, they don't understand the criteria. If they haven't actually tried designing working systems, testing them, and finding they don't work, as people in AI and computer science software engineering have, they won't necessarily have an idea of what the requirements are for adequate theories about what the internal information processing is, or what sorts of mechanisms could support it. This brings to my mind the concept of affordances uh, of Gibson, but what you just said kind of answers, uh, probably. <laughs> how, how many people have heard of James Gibson's series of perception? Oh, quite a lot haven't. Anyway, OK, this had better be my last point before the break. Uh, no, sorry, I thought I'd been gone further. 
won't be the last point because I won't go so long. Uh, a lot of people have been working on visual perception. Um, in AI, it started, I guess, in the very early 60s, maybe even the late 50s, I'm not sure. But certainly by the late 60s, people were both trying to recognize uh, written letters and numerals, but also uh, taking in pictures of hand-drawn pictures, or in some cases photographs, of three-dimensional structures and having the robot find the structure in the images, but also describe the three-dimensional structure. For instance, there's a, a surface here and a surface there, and they meet in this edge. And uh, then there's another surface here, and that edge goes down behind the surface, things of that sort. Uh, that was going on, but it was, it, it was very slow, painful, and uh, limited in what it could do. Uh, progress was being made, but James, uh, James Gibson's view was it was all entirely misguided because what they were assuming was that the information processing task of a perceptual system is to produce descriptions of what's out there. And he said that's not what an organism needs. It needs to know what it can do in order to achieve various goals it needs or in order to avoid various dangers given the resources that it has, the kinds of limbs it has, the things it can see, the things it can sense and so on. And learning what you can do, when and how, and in order to achieve various things, is very different from finding out where the various surfaces are in three-dimensional space. Um, of course, we might need visual systems to do both. And uh, if I get around to it, I will say that if you try to combine what Gibson said with some of the other things, you may start getting an explanation of where human abilities to make discoveries in topology and geometry came from. The ability to perceive and internally represent structures in space, including things like the presence of holes through which things can pass, including the relationships between a possible movement of one thing and the position of another that would obstruct the movement and so on. Uh, not just all the precise locations of all the proportions of surfaces down to the nearest millimeter or centimeter or something, which is what some vision system, AI vision systems try to do, but maybe a coarser grained structural description of what's out there and how it relates to what can happen, but not just happen for the perceiver, but for other perceivers. Will that stop my baby falling into the pond? Or will I, if I go over here, stop that thing over there seeing me? Or if I um, go over there, will I avoid the risk of that thing over there doing something, namely coming down on me when I'm here? It might come down later when I've gone, but that would be all right. So being able to see structures, not in terms of the fine-grained detail of all the parts and so on, but in terms of what sorts of changes are possible that might interact with other things, not just yourself. Gibson tended to overestimate the relevance of perception to the needs of the perceiver, I think. But if you generalize what Gibson was doing, it added a very important whole new raft of functions for perception, which could then be combined with reasoning and play a role in planning. So that would be a form of biological information processing that wasn't noticed by many of the people studying vision, and you're quite right to mention it. Anyway, um, <coughs> what I was earlier saying was that we need to talk about construction kits, because all the things we're talking about, mechanisms for, I've talked about mechanisms for producing materials, mechanisms for assembling materials, but also talks about me mechanisms for performing information processing functions of various sorts. Um, they need to be made by something. And the things that make them are construction kits. And as um, Yun was saying, you could say there's only one construction kit. This may be an inaccurate paraphrase which is the physics and chemistry and everything else that comes out of it is just using one construction kit. But, and they're just hierarchies of structure. But I think there's something else from, bio, I mean, in some sense that's obviously true. 
but in the biological context, there is definitely something else, which is that um, the construction kits that were specialized versions of the general physical chemis chemical mechanisms that enabled new things to be built, like the wood of trees, the muscles of organisms, the materials for, um, uh, for making tendons, the materials for making neurons and transmitting the signals and so on, all those various things, uh, were in some sense encapsulated in designs that could control production of new instances uh, instead of all the new instances have to be having to be found by assembling in a blind sort of way the way evolution starts off the components in the physical world so if you discover that something works well and you can record some process, some of the features of that thing and record some of the processes for assembling them, then future production of instances of that can be done far more efficiently, much less trial and error. You can learn from what you've done. And clearly, biological evolution has learned many things of that sort. There are things that are now routinely made in babies and in plants and so on that were not produced in the earliest days, stages of biological evolution were found useful and then part of the reproductive mechanism produced the apparatus that's ready to build these things, whatever they are. And I'm saying in addition to the apparatus for building physical structures of various sorts, apparatus for assembling them and the information for doing that was also in the genetic me me reproductive mechanism, information about how to build information processing systems of various sorts. At one level, that's pretty obvious because some of the information processing systems are the things that get information, like eyes, ears, touch sensors, taste sensors, smell sensors, and other kinds of things. These are receptors that can, either through radiation or through contact, or through sensing the current temperature and, or other things, they can acquire information which can then be used by other things. But they had to be assembled with the properties required to get that sort of information. So touch sensors are quite complicated things, smell sensors are quite complicated things, and so on. So um, what else can we say about the construction kits? Well. Uh, construction kits can provide platforms on the basis of which new construction kits can be built. Just as a physical construction kit uh, that's already there in physics and chemistry must have provided a platform on top of which the other things that we were talking about get formed. And just one last thing before I hand over. We, in the last half century or so, well, 70 years or so, have been going through that in the history of computing. We've constantly build, been building new construction kits for building information processing systems, including both construction kits for building new physical types of uh, machinery, or computing components, sensors, uh, uh, connectors of various sorts, memories, and so on, but also new types of programming languages, new types of programming tools, new types of debugging tools, new types of operating systems which allow new sorts of programs to be assembled and run and so on. And these are all examples in our own recent history of us building construction kits which make things possible now that were always possible as soon as there were computers in theory. But in practice, there's no way, even if we'd had the powerful enough computers, there's no way those programmers could have said, OK, I'm now going to build um, an internet email system, uh, partly because they wouldn't have had the experience of the requirements for it, but partly because they would have had the experience of designing and building and using all the intermediate layers. And there are many of them to do with uh, transmission across all kinds of different networks, but also the interfaces with users and so on. And those are changing. So we, in the last half century, a bit more, 
have been producing masses of different sorts of construction kits and we're teaching our students, although my own feeling is that because of the way the current educational system is being steered, uh, the education that's being passed on is very narrow. People are saying things, what kinds of programming language are now used in industry? What kinds are you most likely to use? Instead of what kinds of things have been tried and been fun or interesting or whatever. We should be teaching all of that lot to keep the gene pool of ideas for the next generation going. Anyway, sorry Ben. Well, I very much like your, your idea of the importance of construction kits. Um, and I'm wondering, can you characterize the difference between <clears throat> a good construction kit and a kit that would be perhaps for building something, but which would not actually be a construction kit? Now, one of the... the it, it could be a bad construction kit, or it just could be a kit for building a particular thing, and then you were done. My so, well, that's a, that's an issue. Um, one example I think is that back in the day, Lego kits consisted of um, a sort of medium-sized collection of very generic parts. But nowadays, if you go to buy a, a Lego kit, it generally includes a very large, a wide collection of parts that are specialized in order to build a Star Wars scene or a princess castle or some other very particular thing, which <clears throat> I think adds to certain kinds of marketability but detracts from its usability as a construction kit. And I'm wondering if there's a more general idea behind that. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Meccano is the same now. Yes. My grandchildren have these kits to build a particular car and that's it. Yes, and the notion that it's more fun for a kid to be able quickly and easily to build something that's fun to play with or show your friends and so on may be educationally disastrous. <clears throat> but uh, there are all sorts of things people do. And then they include detailed instructions on how to build that part. Yeah. Yes. Accessibility yes. is the key, isn't it? That's the key idea here. I mean, the ability to, to, to be able to add to the affordances within yeah. the kit and not be constrained by what the designer of the kit thought you might like to build with it. Yes. Well, actually, the fact that kits have constraints is very important because some of those constraints are the things that provide the functionality. The functionality is that this will remain rigid if you build it in this way and you might need the rigidity. But that is also a constraint because you might want something that bends and you can't. And when I started writing about this stuff, I made a mistake with Lego. I said if you start with just the basic Lego blocks, you can only make objects uh, whose uh, external surfaces are all parallel to one of the original six, uh, sorry, three orientations of the first brick you start with. And then the colleague said, no, you can do something else. Does anyone know what else you can do with Lego to get something that doesn't constrain you to this orientation? Sorry? Well, no, they're just the original Lego bricks and nothing else. Well. I, Exactly, right. And I didn't think of that myself, but Ron Chrisley, when I said, I made my claim to him, he said, no, what about that? And I have tried a few audiences, there's always someone in the room who thinks it up, uh, but no doubt others would have if I'd given them a bit more time. Anyway, it's a nice example of how things can have uh, designed features which are constraints that were intended and up to a point are the only ones that are used, and then somebody notices an unintended potential in this thing. Now, if humans can do that, when they build construction kits, why can't evolution do that? And it happens over and over again that something that evolved, had some kind of function, was used, then later on became used for other purposes. Um, and uh, there are, there are almost certainly lots of obvious examples of that in terms of physical structure. For instance, we have skin now, which has very specific requirements for humans, but probably came out of older types of skins of different sorts. For instance, most of our ancestors had a lot more hair, I think, 
uh, or in you know, most of our recent ancestors. Uh, but the thing got modified for um, uh, creatures that can make clothing and or can get skins of other animals to keep warm. Sorry? The latest theories about dinosaurs is that they had feathers. Oh, okay, right. Various reasons for uh, yeah. attraction to scary things and so on, but they came to all the birds. Why? Right, so there's an awful lot of serendipity in the uh, processes by which humans produce things. Uh, various kinds of serendipity, you know, somebody does something and then notices something that wasn't uh, intended but is now made possible by what was done. But it can also happen across people, across, across cultures, across generations. Um, and I'm sure you will all think of examples. Now, um, is there a, a good way to round up, yes, there is a good way to round up this part of the, of the session because I've been talking about construction kits, I've hinted that there are different sorts of construction kits, and I want to divide them into three major classes, and I'm sure instantly some of you will start thinking, thinking of things that I haven't thought of. There are what I would call concrete construction kits that are made of physical components uh, that can be assembled in physical relationships. And the fundamental construction kit that's provided by physics and chemistry at least has that. And um, the physical structures and relationships can include things like uh, electromagnetic forces uh, and um, uh, radiation and various other kinds of things. It's a very, very rich construction kit. Almost certainly has properties that we still don't yet understand. And I will show you a cartoon about, if I can get it quickly. Uh, now, where did I put this? I've got it all prepared somewhere. I know what, I'll just go and get it out of the Do any of you know the SMBC thing? It's a Saturday morning breakfast comics. Um, well, there's a, a, a comic in there that I thought I had put in this place where I would be able to find it quickly. And I've obviously, I've got it here, but I've just obviously put it somewhere where it's different from where it is. But it shows, um, uh, cavemen arguing about what's fundamental. Um, and some of you may have seen it. Well, maybe I can get Google to find it for me. I actually set it up late last night so that I could find it, and I've now been doing too many things since then. And I might have just placed it. That's probably it. Could be. Yep. Um. Right. So it's a vertical comic strip. Big rock is most fundamental particle in the universe. No, big rock is made up of small rocks. To Collider! So now they go to the Collider. And um, the Collider is a great big hole. And they send the rocks down from either side. And um, look, small rock come out of big rock. Small rock, fundamental. Small rock is maybe a statistical artifact. <laughs> so they do some more. OK, small rock, fundamental. Me told you so. Wait, says someone coming here in the background. Small rock made up of very small rocks. Very small rock is fundamental. No such thing as very small rock. 
the collider. <laughs> Some more? Ha! Very small rocks, not split. Small rock is fundamental. Sure. Just need rocks go faster, then find very small rock. 10,000 iterations later. Professor, what's a fundamental particle? Anything smaller than what was fundamental a generation ago. <laughs> Um, I like it so much that it's whether it's relevant or not, I thought it should share it. So, just to wrap up, there are three kinds of construction kits. There are what I call concrete construction kits made of physics and chemistry, and we'll be talking a lot about them. There are abstract construction kits, uh, which are quite well talk about things like grammars, um, sets of axioms. Uh, rules for abstract games, um, where each time you play a game, you use a construction kit to, um, to, to play the game, uh, quiz games or whatever. Uh, and then there are hybrid construction kits where you have both the physical and these abstract things. And I think, to a first approximation, you can say that board games like chess and, and um, uh, song, or abstract construction kits. You have components, you can construct a game by manipulating control, control uh, these um, components, but there are also abstract rules saying what you can and can't do and deciding who's winning and what, you know, what's a game and what isn't. In some of the cases, like chess, uh, some people are able to dispense with the physical component and just play the game as a totally abstract game using a totally abstract construction kit, you know, just by correspondence, etc. Now, what I'm going to need to think about and talk about over the whole break is that biology and evolution, I think, make use of all three of those types of things, physical construction kits, abstract construction kits, and hybrid construction kits, where there's somehow the abstract construction kits are constraining the things that are done with the physical construction kit, even though the physical construction kit has more potential uh, than this abstract construction kit, abstract set of rules or whatever last year. But have a good break. Thank you. I'll show something um, that I've already showed a subset of people who are at this morning at a meeting this morning, which is uh, uh, what a weaver bird can do, and also how a young one gets um, can get into trouble. I think this should just be set up to work. Weaver birds, male weaver birds, get long thin leaves and then they start weaving them together. And when they're still learning, they prepare loops to make knots, holding them with the feet. And then they get a free end and they cleverly get their mouth towards the end so they can push the end through a hole and then they forget to hold the loop. <laughs> so I have to start again. But. Um, that process eventually is mastered, and um, this is part of a BBC video. In fact, if you just go and ask for <coughs> Weaver Bird Nest BBC YouTube, you'll see this. It lasts about, I think, eight or nine minutes, the whole lot. I'm not going to show it all. But um, some of the questions I was asking about the um, 17 months, 17 and a half months old child, you know, what's going on in her brain? about pencil and hole and paper and motion and what's possible and what will change after various things. You can ask similar questions about weaver birds. Does it, for instance, when it was pulling the end of the, th the leaf until it was grasping it near the end, did, did it have an intention, I must hold it near the end so that I can push the end through a loop? 
or is it just triggered by holding a, any leaf automatically to start pulling itself to the end because the evolution has discovered that that's a useful thing for weaver birds to do and then when they get to the end something triggers them into pushing that end through a loop if they remember to hold the loop tight with their feet or what. Uh, th these, the nests they make are, have a few thousand leaves. Now you've seen what happens with the first one or two leaves. Ben. Uh, do adult weaver birds show much more expertise? Is this something that's very different between young and older weaver birds? Let me show you what happens when the adults have um, done their job. I think there's a, video, a portion of the video right at the beginning that, so those are finished. Okay, it's very short. They see, can I get it there and hold it there? Um, nope. <coughs> so that. I think <coughs> if they're going through the same kind of bungled execution with 5,000 leaves, this would take a lifetime. <laughs> it's, it's not a quick job. But I, I'm not an expert on weaver birds. Uh, there's a biologist in, I think, Aberdeen University, Sue, forgot her name. Uh, but my experience of other birds is that uh, the expert ones really look at what they've partly built, crows for instance, and then they'll weave something in, a, a twig in that case, which is in some ways simple, in other ways not so simple because these can be bent, the twigs can't. Um, as opposed to a video I saw of an eagle making a nest. Now I have no idea whether all eagles are like this one, but it showed the part built eagle nest the eagle landed on it holding a twig and strutted around, dropped a twig, looked at it, picked it up, strutted around, dropped a twig. And I have no idea what was going on, but it may just be that there's something about that pattern which has some terminating condition that the eagle doesn't really understand, but brings it about that there's a good platform on which the eagles can then lay their, build their nests or whatever, you know, put the stuff that, that's needed to hold the eggs. Um, there's a huge variety of kinds of nests. There are some that are built just by bringing bits of mud. And the great thing about a bit of mud is that if you've got a pot built nest and you bring a bit of mud, you just put it where it needs to go. And you don't have to do any weaving or threading or anything, which you have to do with many other structures. Um, so those are all examples of construction kits which are mixtures of materials, mud, twig, feathers, leaves, all kinds of junk that various birds use, plus sets of instructions or programs or rules which are more abstract things specifying what to do when under various conditions, um, as a result of which many species of birds get their nests built, and then they bring up their, their young. Um, I, don't, I think the other video I had here was the baby, and oh, I'll just do it once more with the original video instead of the um, terrible GIF file. That's a slightly slowed down version of the video, so now you see stuff there. Uh, for the GIF file, I just wanted, didn't want to have other people's feet in. And I also didn't want such a big thing on the website. So it's all very deliberate. The actual speed is about one and a half times that. So that can now go to bed. But if you, if you look around, or look on YouTube now increasingly, um, you can get all kinds of information that once upon a time you could only get by reading books written by ethologists. There are people like Tim Bergen and um, uh, Lawrence Durrell and uh, Conrad Lawrence and dozens of other people who spent hours and years and w w whatever in particular environments studying animals. 
uh, and discovering painstakingly some of the things that you can now see through your own, through other people's windows because they put web webcams there. For instance, one of the things that I think it was uh, Conrad Lawrence found was that there was um, a water shrew that had a route that it followed to go and get something from the river, which at one point involved jumping onto a rock and then jumping onto another rock and then carrying on beyond that. And one day he thought he would see what happens if you remove the second rock. So this little creature came along, came into the first rock, jumped to the second one, crashed to the ground because the rock wasn't there, came back, climbed on the first one, jumped to where the second one used to be, <laughs> crashed to the ground. So that's an, an illustration of how when you see the successful performance, you don't necessarily have enough evidence to justify the claim that they know what they're doing or why they're doing it. Because if they did know that, then they would be able to adjust the behavior in a situation where something has changed and the advantage that they were getting from the rock, maybe getting quickly to something else, was not available, but they could still continue going in the same direction anyway. So I'd say that that's the sort of indication of a kind of partial understanding of spatial structure and how it relates to possible motions and possible goals uh, of the organism. And I think if you watch very young humans, you see lots of intermediate cases. And Piaget, in particular, uh, was, has lots of them recorded in his um, books on children and child development, far more than I've actually read, I'm afraid. But unfortunately for him, there was a scientific ethos that said, case studies aren't real science, you've got to collect statistics and show that you've got some regularity that passes some standard statistical test, which is totally wrong as a, a view of what you have to do in order to do science. Um, and it's uh, corrupted the brains of, unfortunately, many young scientists. But um, still, Piaget went on, and uh, there's masses of stuff. I'll give you... No, I won't. Uh, he has, I'll just tell you about two books that are not widely known. Uh, they were published after he died, I think, or maybe just one of them just before he died. One of them was on possibility, and the other is on necessity. Has anybody come across these books by Piaget and collaborators? They're always collaborators. He has these colleagues who do the experiments. Um, and if you ever get hold of those, uh, there are second-hand copies around. They were translated into English in uh, late 1980s. I think they were published in the early 1980s. He died somewhere around that time. Um, but he would ask, set up a situation and ask a child, what else can you do? Or how could it be different? And he noticed very interesting differences between the very young children and as they got older, the kinds of things they would do and the kinds of ways in which they would respond. And one of the things I think I was telling Alan earlier this morning was a young child who was, who had, I think, three buttons or something and was asked how they could go on the table, put them in some configuration, was asked how else they could go on the table and the child moves them around a bit. And this happened a few times and then when the experimenter said, and what else? The child said, that's all. Um, no more possibilities. <laughs> and of course, we will never know whether this child had sussed out that this is something stupid and boring that'll go on forever and was refusing to play the game and was being quite intelligent or really had somehow not understood that possibilities uh, were being asked for which had a kind of continuum to first approximation uh, and you just go on forever. The older children could detect that and, and respond and say that. Uh, but that, the, the, if that child didn't know that and just said that's all because they couldn't think of anything else to do which they thought of as different, then that would show you something about a transitional state in understanding of what I was talking about earlier, Gibson's affordances and what's possible in a situation and how possibilities vary. Uh, there, there has been experiment, I don't remember who, by whom, the, they would give children a grid uh, four by four and say that this is a roof and they would ask 
uh, to place 16 snowflakes that are falling from the sky on, on this roof. And some children would place them exactly in the middle of the squares, while someone would close their eyes and just put them randomly. And this apparently correlated, like, correlated with creativity and also like attention disorders, this clever solution of randomness, while this, uh, this systematic solution, which was kind of wrong, correlated with actually success in, in, in school. Well, was and being obsessive. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyway, this, the, there's a huge, um, for all practical purposes, infinite set of experiments you can do with young children. And coming up with good ones that will shed some new light on our attempts to understand what's going on, how the brains work, what construct construction kits they're using, what stage they are in various kinds of processes. Um, it's quite hard to be both creative and profound. It's easy to interact with children in creative ways, but to get something that gives you a window into what's going on is quite difficult. Uh, there, there are quite a lot of people who've written about children in creative ways and sometimes with great observations. Have any, has anyone met uh, anything written by John Holt? He's quite well known in educational systems for his criticisms of education policy. And he has, he has a lot of things. What happens when you give children paper tape? How many people in the room are young enough to know what paper tape is? There used to be computer paper tape with punch holes, and when they were discarded, one of the things you could do is give them to kids, and then he'd let them do things. And one of the things he recorded, not with paper tape, in one of his books was a child who saw a vacuum cleaner next to a wall, and it was unplugged. And this child uh, took the nozzle of the vacuum cleaner, it must have been a cylinder vacuum cleaner, not an upright, and put it against the plug in the wall, and then picked up the electric plug and held it against the palm. Now, what that seemed to suggest to at least the person who noticed that was that this child had some theory that there's something in the wall sucking the dust through the nozzle into the vacuum cleaner and then out through the wire into the wall. And this child, being a good scientist, was trying to see if that process would work the other way around. But who knows? Anyway, it's the sort of thing that human child intelligence is capable of, among many others. And it's part of what we, I, th I think it'll take some time before we see our robots demonstrating such a variety of types of creativity be because of understanding the space of possibilities surrounding them with the materials, the objects, and the structure of the three-dimensional space. Now, uh, I think I was starting to talk about construction kits, and I don't remember if, there's, if it's worth going back into. OK. Bugger. I don't know what's happening to my screen, but whatever it is, I'm just going to put this down. That was for another talk. My screen has got into a funny state. It won't do what it normally does. Construction kits. Right. Um, I think I will just say a few more things about types of construction kits that seem to have been produced by biological evolution, which you will easily recognize as me hallucinating onto biology, stuff I've learned about technology, human technology, in the last 60 years or so. Um, and it may well be that there are types of construction kits that are as important and in some sense play related roles that I haven't noticed and maybe someone else will. Um, 
Uh, and this could get very boring, so I, I think I'll just sort of skip along at a high level and see if anybody has any ideas that they want to. And if you want to go and read the details, it'll be on my website if you look for construction kits, Aaron Sloman or whatever. Um, so <clears throat> here are some general things about construction kits, repeating what I said earlier. Each of these points is expanded if I click on the link, and I won't unless I have to. Um, associated with a particular construction kit are two important things that seem to be general in connection with the construction kit, namely that there's a set of possibilities and then there are constraints. For that construction kit, certain things are impossible. Now, when the construction kits are abstract and are constructed in a space that itself is totally transparent, we can see everything there is to it because it's, say, a bunch of rules that we have made up. Uh, there's not as much opportunity to miss things as there is when the construction kit's made of physical materials. And I gave the example of the Lego to illustrate that. I missed, when I first saw that this Lego thing, thing had the constraints that I think Alan also pointed out, that the, with the simple Lego just made of bricks, everything must have surfaces parallel to the original surfaces. I missed the point about being able to put a new brick with its corner overlapping an old brick so that there was just one circular bit socket, uh, acting as a socket with another circular bit going into that socket, and then that allowed circular hinge-like motion. Ben so, hmm? Ben gets the credit for pointing that out. He? Ben gets the credit for the observation. Yes, but I thought you were the one who drew the same conclusion I did, that, there's, that there are constraints. And Ben pointed out a limit. OK, sorry, anyway. Um, uh, someone I thought said it, maybe it was just... Uh, yes, Ben pointed out, and also Ron Chrisley, and a few other people in some of these lectures, and probably a lot more of you if I'd given you more time, but I uh, didn't want to set an exam for half an hour and then see how many people got it. Um, so there are possibilities and impossibilities, and that's connected with something which is a theme that I haven't haven't really talked about explicitly, there's been an undercurrent. I've been talking about children making discoveries that are in some sense mathematical in, in structure, but I, in this talk, unlike the one I did earlier and I'm mixing up my head, I don't think I've said that a child may be aware not only of possibilities, you can move this pencil around or you can but having pushed it in, you can put it out, but also impossibilities. Um, there are, for example, things that conjurers, stage magicians do that work because people who are not mathematicians actually understand some mathematical impossibilities. For example, one of these kinds of tricks involves rings that are shown to, they seem to be solid, rings with no gaps in them and he bounces them on one and then waves them around and suddenly they're linked and can do it in front of your eyes and you know people are amazed and so why are they amazed because they know that what they've seen is impossible how do they know it's impossible they haven't been to topology courses where they've learned that if you have two toruses in a space where they're not interlinked, then there's no continuous deformation that will get them linked. And yet they seem to have seen what looks like, actually it's not really a continuous deformation. They're not really toruses, they're cleverly designed. So if you do the right movement very quickly and you're very skillful, you can make it look as if they've just somehow become linked. Um, and probably, if you thought about it, you, you probably think of other tricks that impress people because they know that something is, in, in a sense, not just unusual, not statistically improbable, but it shouldn't be possible at all, and therefore they're amazed when it happens. 
and it doesn't require special mathematical education. So what I'm saying is that far more people have mathematical capabilities and it's generally acknowledged. And that's one instance of it, and there are lots of others. Um, in general, noticing a new set of possibilities in a situation and some, appreciating some of the constraints in that set of possibilities uh, can happen in two ways. Well, maybe more than two, but at least two very different ways that I want to distinguish. One is you generate lots and lots of random movements of yourself or other things and see what happens. And then you can discover that some things happen and others not. But of the things that don't happen, you strictly have not learned anything except they didn't happen. You might find some things happen very rarely in that situation. Okay, that's a different kind of thing. What I've just described is typical of a kind of learning that's based on statistical sampling of a space of possibilities that can tell you that some things are possible, that some things are more frequent than others in a given setup, that some things are very infrequent, but never that something is impossible. Okay? For that, you need something else. Now, I don't have in my own mind a very clear and coherent uh, notion of what that something else is. Amongst philosophers, are there any philosophers here? Apart from you, a philosopher, and, a and at least one another. Own some more. Good. All right. Among philosophers, there is a category of, of knowledge of impossibilities that uh, goes back at least to David Hume and also Immanuel Kant commented on it, uh, things that are analytically true or analytically false, where what analytically true or false means is that there are definitions linking the terms in a statement expressing this impossibility and then if you understand logical inference and those definitions then you can draw conclusions so for instance if a bachelor is defined to be an adult male unmarried human being then no bachelor is married can be derived logically from that bachelors are unmarried and that's a standard sort of example given a slightly more complicated example uh, you can construct things about what sorts of nieces or uncles or whatever can so for instance uh, can you have a maternal bachelor, uh, an uncle who's a bachelor on your maternal side? Yes, your mother can have, a, can have a brother who's not married. Can you have a maternal uncle who's an uncle-in-law who's a bachelor? What's an uncle-in-law? It's like a brother-in-law. Can a brother-in-law be a bachelor? Well, yes, it depends which way you are. But you can think about the configurations. You find some configurations are possible, some not. And the ones that are not possible are not possible because of that definition. The possibilities come from A being married to B and B being married to the person to C or whatever. And the first, sorry, A being a sibling of B and B being married to someone, A can be a bachelor. But if it's the other way around, then neither B or C can be a bachelor. Uh, so you can discover possibilities that are simple, and then you can just, I'm sorry, I screwed it up, but you can work out the details. You can discover impossibilities that are more complicated because you have more complicated chains of relationships, but nevertheless, the impossibility comes from definitions which are explicit plus pure logical deduction, whatever that means, which is itself something to be discussed. I'll leave it off for now. So uh, maybe it'll switch itself off if I don't go back. Um, so where was I? So th there is at least one way of discovering that something is impossible, which is another way of discovering that something is necessary. If something is not 
possibly true, then it's necessarily false. If something's not possibly false, then it's necessarily true. So discovering that things are necessary or that are, they're impossible are duels of each other, okay? And according to at least one philosophical view, which is often attributed to David Hume, although I sometimes wonder whether he was actually too intelligent to think this, but anyway, the only kind of impossibility is the sort that comes from logic and definitions. Anything else is only empirically impossible, which means that you've not yet found a way of uh, producing a counterexample, but if you went up a high mountain or went to another planet or changed the temperature to close to zero or whatever, you might then produce a counterexample. But you can't do that with finding a bachelor who's married because uh, the, the definition and logic of relationships rule that out. So <clears throat> Immanuel Kant said uh, Hume as understood as saying there's only empirical knowledge and trivial logical analytic knowledge. Kant said, no, there's something else. There's mathematical knowledge. And mathematical knowledge can include the kinds of things that I've been talking about. If you have two um, rings and they're solid, uh, yeah, there's no continuous change motions by which they can come to be uh, linked. If solid implies that one can't pass through the other. How do you know that? Well, it seems to be part of a general ability that humans have to be able to think about implications of spatial relationships, some of which you get taught at school, unfortunately not always taught anymore, uh, which come from Euclidean geometry. There are also some that are involve topology. Um, I would use a relatively simple example from geometry that I apologize to Alan because he had it this morning. Uh, some of you will know that it's, if you have a triangle on a planar surface, the internal angles of the triangle always have the same sum. Um, is that a surprise to anybody? You can have a long, thin triangle with a point up there and two little angles on the short side here, and you measure the angles and add them up, you get 180 degrees, half a rotation. If you change the shape, equilateral triangle, same thing. Now, according to Hume, or Hume as generally interpreted, either that's going to be an empirical generalization which could, could become false at a high temperature or in a strong magnetic field or something. Or else, if it is true and doesn't have exceptions, it must be because there's something in the definitions of angle and side and triangle and whatever from which you can derive it. And Kant thought, it's neither. You can't get it by logic and definitions. And Nevertheless, you can see that there are no counterexamples because there is a proof available in Euclidean geometry. Anyone remember a proof? Yes, there's a standard proof that uses parallel lines. Right. Um, has anyone ever come across a proof that the internal lengths of a triangle add up to a straight line without using any parallel lines? Okay. Alan has, because we've talked about this. Uh, let me give you a proof that was invented by a former student called Mary Pardo when she was teaching maths, and she's trying to teach the standard proof, and her students had trouble remembering it. And she wasn't sure whether her proof was okay. So she showed me her proof, which went like this. If you have a triangle, say there's a triangle there, any triangle, I don't have to draw it exactly, because you'll understand. You can stick something along, say, the base of the triangle. And remember, there are three angles. There's one at each end of this space, and there's another one up there somewhere. You can rotate the thing that's on the first, that's lying along the side, until it's on the second side, through the first angle. It's been through one angle. You can then rotate it through the second angle to get to the third side, and then you can rotate it through the final angle to get back to the original side. And in that process, what has it done? It's done that. 
So those three angles must add up to that. What's that? It's half a rotation, because it ends up on the same lines it started with. Half a rotation is 180 degrees. What difference would it make if that angle, that corner were a long way up? Wouldn't make any difference, because we can slide it along to this side, keep it in the same orientation so the angle wouldn't change, rotate it through that next angle to get to the final side, come back. And no matter how the triangle changes its shape, you can do that. Now, why am I giving this proof? Well, one reason is that it's actually, I think, much easier for most people who've never studied any geometry to take in and see there can't be any exceptions. There are, not everybody finds it so convincing. Um, does anyone have any comments on that proof? Yes? Suppose you're trying to go at one vertex at the North Pole, one at the East Pole, and one at the West Pole. I mean, what I mean actually is and yeah. the, the base goes 90 degrees around the equator. Now, this is a very big triangle. But so, so you then have a total of 270 degrees. Um, yeah, but they can do the same. Uh, exactly. So if we take the original proof that was given in Euclidean geometry, um, it assumes that you've, you have a planar surface and you draw lines parallel to the original lines and you say things about the angles. But if you draw your triangle on a sphere, the original proof also breaks down because you can uh, get a counterexample. Yeah, sorry? The angles don't add up to 180 degrees. The, they can be 90 degrees uh, from here to there. Then at the North Pole, you go through another 90 degrees. And then you come down there, and you go through another 90 degrees. And you've got three lots of 90 degrees, which is that's but, because some of them go in the third dimension. That's right. But what you have spotted is that there's something that remains true about the motion of this thing in that surface. It doesn't ever cross over itself. It just goes through. So there's a kind of structural property of the surface, uh, which I have, I wasn't going to say anything about. I've not thought enough about it. But it's, it's a kind of analog, a kind of generalization of the original theorem. But I think maybe we should discuss it privately later, because ex exactly what to say about it isn't clear. It's certainly not clear to me. Unless you've got some. The angle yeah? pointer sweeps. It sweeps through a plane. And what you're measuring is the triangle that cuts through the middle of the Earth, not the one that lays <laughs> uh, you're projecting the triangle onto a plane going through the center of the Earth. That's right. And then you're projecting the shadow of the That's rotating. The point of Uh, well, the But, but in my in in this. No, no, because it has to be it has to be tangent to the edge of the triangle. No, because I have a curved object that fits neatly on the surface of the sphere, and I can rotate it. Right. Never mind. Let's. Yeah. Right. You're right. Um, what I can't do in that case is slide this and rotate it in the plane of, this, of the triangle, because there is no plane of the triangle. There's infinitely many planes that are tangents to the sphere. So what it means right? is that if I take a directed, say, like an arrow or a pointer, mm -hmm. and I do something that ends it up pointing in the opposite direction on the same line, that doesn't tell me it has swept through 180 degrees, unless you have the assumption that it's in the same Yep. Um, <laughs> now, what, what this discussion illustrates very nicely for my purposes is that we have ways of reasoning about what is possible or impossible or about what the necessary consequences are of some structural specification that are not logical. They involve visualizing transformations of structures in space. What happens when you're trying to prove something using logic? Well, you might visualize logical formulae. 
you might visualize transformation. I'll substitute this constant for that variable, and therefore I have to substitute there because the universal quantifier, and then I instantiate and so on. But you're still dealing with structures uh, which have parts and relationships and constraints that the system of logic that you're using allows you to, uh, uh, to make some moves and rules out others. For example, you wouldn't be allowed to change the variable that's bound, two instances of a variable that's bound to, by a universal quantifier by replacing one of them with one constant and the other one with another constant, if you're doing things in accordance with logic. Um, so what I'm getting at is that the ability to do logical reasoning depends on abilities to perceive structures, to perceive potential for change in structures, and to see the consequences of some of the allowed structures allowed by the rules of that particular construction kit. And construction kits with rules may be arbitrary. We can invent some rule which says, um, if I draw a line, you can draw a circle. And, uh, and then we can go drawing lines and circles, and there may or may not be anything interesting to come out of that. But uh, some construction kits, abstract construction kits dealing with sets of rules, have been proved to be very useful for all kinds of things. And logic is an example of that. And the kind of construction kit for shapes that Euclid summarized in the elements two and a half thousand years ago, long before the discovery of modern logic, was another very useful one of profound importance for science and engineering since then, including Newton and lots of other things. So what I, the moral of all of that stuff, which some aspects of which will be familiar to people in the room, others of which I think you will find strange, you might even feel I'm pulling a fast run or something because I've taken familiar stuff and put it in a new context. I'm saying evolution, in some sense, produced amongst its construction kits these collections of structures with rules for combining and recombining them and made use of them. How? By allowing instances of other processes in evolution, namely animals, to do reasoning about spatial structures and processes in order to work out things they can and can't do, in order to work out how the situation will change. If, if the weaver bird moves to grasp the end of the leaf, then by moving its beak, it can move the end of the leaf through a loop. If it doesn't grasp the end, it goes somewhere away from the end. If it moves its beak through the loop, then the end might still be quite a long way from the loop. So the weaver bird may not realize that, or maybe it does. I don't know. But if it does, that would show a kind of grasp of geometrical reasoning, which, um, as far as I know, has never been studied to find out exactly uh, how far it goes with weaver, weaver birds, and it might be very hard to study. You could probably, if you're really ingenious, you could set up experiments to find out whether they understand that or not. Um, for instance, if they, if you, oh, I, I shouldn't do this, I've just had an idea. You could make a, a new kind of leaf which changes color in the middle, and it's perfectly visible all the way, but they only move the beak to the point where the color changes because that's what they've been programmed to do. Then, if they then try to move it through, instead of moving it to the end of the leaf, that would be some evidence that they don't understand what the end of the leaf is and what the consequences of moving it are. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's just a thought that occurred to me. So, uh, what I'm getting at then is that amongst the types of information processing um, done by Information users, where am I? Uh, construction kits for making information users. Information users of many kinds. Um, and there are some that can do some of the kinds of reasoning in abstract about actions before they happen and thinking about the consequences. Humans definitely, and some intelligent birds and elephants and various other squirrels. Um, but there are other kinds of information users that can only take immediately available information 
take immediate and immediately respond to it, and then an opportunity has passed, uh, they get on with the next thing. What would be an example of that? Um, a reflex physical response to some triggering stimulus would be a case where the stimulus would be some information, rapid movement towards the eye, the response might be the blink, and there wouldn't be any consideration of possible blinkings of different styles and speeds and orientations of your eyes or whatever. Uh, and the mechanisms that perform that, that produce that immediate response um, could be very useful without having all these other features. Of course, that mechanism will be, in some sense, a fairly straightforward to implement in physical mechanisms. You can set up things that detect a change in the photons reaching a portion of the retina, a particular pattern of stimulation. That triggers a neural signal. That triggers some muscle to, to um, contract in the eye shuts. Um, but something that is going to take information about possible reorientations of leaves, possible changes of grip, possible ways in which if you go in this direction, you'll be visible by that thing over there, whereas if you go in that direction, you won't be visible by that thing over there. And if you don't want to be eaten by that thing over there, then maybe you should go this way. Um, that requires a kind of use of information about what would happen if information about possible futures as opposed to just information about what's happening now with an immediate response to it. So that in some sense evolution discovered how to make organisms that could do that. How many different forms of that there are, I don't know. Uh, it's one thing to be able to reason about um, for example, whether with your current length of reach you can touch something like that chair over there or not, and if you can't, then to reason that if you move forward, you'll reach a point where you can. Uh, it's something very different to reason that if you went to fetch a pole and held it, you could have a longer reach using the end of the pole to touch the thing. Um, there's something in common between those two situations, but there's also something different in that you have, in the one you're just talking about moving the things that are already in that situation, changing the relationships. In the other, you're talking about adding something new from outside that set of relationships uh, to alter the possibilities for contact. Um, I suspect that between the earliest um, single-celled organisms or even simpler things, if there were some prebiotic things that were reacting to the environment and the kinds of things I'm talking about, there were far more intermediate stages than anybody has ever thought of. Um, but I don't know what they were, and I don't know how they were implemented. But that will be part of this research project to investigate um, the ways in which evolution produced new kinds of information processing and uh, new kinds of users of information processing. I'll mention something that um, some people have studied because I think it can be generalized. Has anyone heard of Darcy Thompson? He was a biologist about 100 years ago who, building on some ideas, I think that came from Goethe, who was both a poet and a biologist, or at any rate, a theoretician, philosopher, they noticed that there were patterns in the structures of animals. And Darcy Thompson, I think he had a 2,000 page, in a huge book, which I haven't read, collecting examples of relationships between structures of different organisms of related species and relationships between structures of individual organisms during their development. Um, 
and he was sure there was something deep and important about the way evolution uh, was making use of commonalities of structure. There was a biologist uh, whom I met when I was at Sussex University called Brian Goodwin, anyone counted him, who had similar insights, um, but he went further. I don't know if this was in Darcy Thompson, but it was certainly in Brian Goodwin. And he, he used to say that the processes by which organisms form from a fertilized egg are deeply constrained by what geometry and, and topology and, and the space-time structures make possible. Therefore, it's not necessary for the genes to specify the structures. The genes may specify something, but much more work uh, can be done by what geometry allows, what laws of form, as he called them, allow, uh, then biologists realize, and therefore the genome doesn't need to do as much work as people think. And there may be something in that. Uh, a few weeks ago I went to a talk by a um, biologist who came to visit our um, maths department talking about uh, viruses whose form of replication seems to make use of the f geometric uh, symmetries and regularities that are just possible given the structures of the molecules. And therefore, if the materials are there and the environment is there, these are the shapes that, the only shapes that can come out. So there isn't any need for there to be a genetic information structure specifying that shape. Yep? There may be other more environmental factors. I've got, this, I've got this dim memory of some experiments with spiders on the space station and how they made webs. And the webs were a mess because of the absence of gravity. gravity so yeah. gravity was a factor in successfully helping them make webs. Right, and th that would also be part of the kind of thing that I think uh, Darcy Thompson and Brian Goodwin had in mind. Oh, I thought I saw you wave your hand, sorry. Okay. Okay, so... I'll give you another example, which I expect somebody has uh, commented on in exactly the same way as I'm going to, but I'm, I, I don't remember. I might even have read it somewhere, but I don't remember. There are many organisms that are born with a kind of structure which, in the case of humans, involves limbs, um, digestive system, uh, various parts of the body with various functions, like a mouth for food, and, excretion mechanisms and so on. Uh, but as they grow, uh, these parts change in all sorts of ways. In particular, they get bigger, the ratios change, the relative ratios of limbs and body and so on. The weights change so that, for instance, the force required to lift your arm is much bigger when you're an adult than when you're a two-week-old baby. Well, then or something uh, small. Um, and um, the, uh, the weights, the angular momentums when they move, the possible kind of damage one bit can do to another if moved inappropriately will change. So the control mechanisms for producing motion in such systems need to take account of these changes as the organism grows. For instance, if you think of it in terms of lots of control loops with uh, negative feedback control and whatever, parameters might have to change uh, to allow for what happens uh, when the weights change or the size change or whatever. Will the conditions of stability change? Because you're now walking upright, whereas previously you were just crawling. So. I'm trying to generalize observations that people have made about how there are patterns that continue during development and also across species, which are physical, geometrical, topological patterns. I'm saying likewise there will be patterns in the information processing uh, requirements for controlling the movements of these structures and things that can move. Now, how would um, modern engineer deal with that? 
Well, one very common solution is use of parameters. You wouldn't want to have a whole bunch of programs for your robot which have to be used until it's grown a bit and then thrown away and when it gets a bit bigger as a new program comes. You would have parameters that have bits that can vary, that take as input the current length or the current weight or the current um, a maximum angular extension or whatever and then can produce some movements to achieve some goal that's specified in an appropriate language. I suspect that that process of taking some form that can vary in a whole variety of ways while something remains common and capturing the requirements for control in a common structure with parts that can vary, I suspect that that was discovered by evolution long before programmers discovered it. And it wasn't immediately obvious to all the programmers who wrote lots of lines of code uh, that, that they had these opportunities. And in particular, some of you will know about object-oriented programming languages, which I think started taking off around about 1969 after uh, Simula 69 were introduced this notion that you can have um, a kind of program that itself is made up of bits of program where those bits of program can be replaced by parameters just as in other cases you can replace a number by a program uh, by a variable you can replace a program by a variable so you can have a pattern which is filled in not just by numbers or names or particular objects but patterns that are filled in by other programs and these uh, things might be called methods in object-oriented programming um, which can themselves take methods as arguments. Some languages make this easier than others but I hope the main point is that um, there, there are things you can do to economize in the design process by abstracting from some complex structure which includes information processing parts something that can be fixed while other parts change. And that's a very powerful way of covering a variety of designs. And I think that's essential for the design, for the control structures of a developing organism that changes as much as a baby horse to an adult horse or a baby human to an adult human and so on. Um, if evolution was able to do that, that might have required some change in the, the ways in which genetic information get encoded. Uh, do any of you know about, well some of you will know about genetic programming. Uh, there are ways of trying to emulate evolutionary processes in computing by producing things that are called genetic algorithms, which are programs that take things that are supposed to be analogs of genomes, bit patterns or groups of letters or whatever, and when they're fed into some structure, they produce behavior or they produce solutions to problems, and then you can randomly try changing parts of this thing in the way that evolution seems to randomly change bits of the, de of the genome. And there's a lot of work has shown that you're able to solve some quite hard problems by making a program evolve designs by just finding strings that, when they're suitably interpreted, solve a problem uh, by searching through a space of possible strings. And I'm saying, and actually before me, other people had said, instead of just strings of arbitrary symbols, you could have structures which are themselves made of structures, and some of them can be preserved and others may be variable, and you can put them together in different ways, and that was called genetic programming. I haven't given a very good or accurate description of it, but it had some very nice features. It meant that things that, it could be, that had been learned at a certain sort of abstraction could be used to produce lots of examples that took as components structured entities and assembled them in some way. Um, 
And again, maybe evolution discovered that kind of structuring of genetic information, the benefits of that kind of structuring of genetic information long before we did. It meant that if you'd found a good design for a kind of sensor and a good design for a kind of physical limb structure and a good design for a particular kind of um, a controlling mechanism and a good design for a way of putting together the sensors, the limbs, the controlling mechanism for achieving certain sorts of goals. What you could do is that the design for putting those things together could itself be used with different things that are put together. And so you can then, if you can inherit that, you might have something that enables you in a new environment to change the bits of behavior or at different stages in development to change the bits of behavior. So that's an example of a kind of construction kit for generating new construction kits by being able to form patterns from previously formed construct. I accidentally jumped. I think I should just get rid of all this because I'm going on too long. I'm going to have to end soon. And there's far more stuff than I'm going to have time for, so I'll just try to. Um, we end at 5.30, so we've got about half an hour left, right? Yeah. So let's um, just find a blank screen for the moment. I might want to go back. What I've been trying to do in the last few minutes is show that this apparently simple and obvious notion that evolution might find something useful and then make versions of it which can then be used without being rediscovered in future generations. Some of those things could be abstractions which when they're instantiated produce very different cases because what comes in is not just something like a change in length or a change in size or whatever, but a change in something much more complex. There could be, for example, a discovery of a general pattern that can be instantiated in different ways to produce languages for communication or languages for forming plans. But the general pattern might have a huge variety of instances which are suited to different environments. Well, that is roughly speaking the claim that Chomsky makes about uh, the biological basis of human languages, namely that there are several thousand human languages uh, and who knows how many more that have existed in the past, which any human with the normal human genetic apparatus, uh, barring various kinds of damage during birth or whatever, uh, any hu normal human can develop if put in an appropriate environment where there are people using language. Um, and what this generic pattern has is a very abstract structure that allows enormous, an enormous variety of types of grammar, types of vocabulary, types of uh, vocal patterns used in producing languages. For instance, some languages there are lots of click sounds and others something different. Um, I suspect that we haven't really understood the details of that. Uh, and furthermore, I suspect that that was a late development of something that was earlier discovered in much more general case to cover things like uh, the growth of an organism allowing uh, some common structure for controlling movements and so on, while the details varied a lot as strength and momentum and weight and so on changed. Um, and by the way, if evolution finds a common structure that allows an organism to grow, then that common structure might also be capable of being used for a new species of a different type. Uh, so perhaps once evolution started producing vertebrates with four limbs, 
uh, it was able to reuse some abstract specification for control systems for vertebrates with four limbs, where the details were quite different depending on whether you're an elephant or a crocodile or a human or a, or a rat or whatever. Uh, now, that ability to take to notice amongst a collection of rather complicated structures some common pattern that can be specified and then instantiated in different cases is one of the key features of being a mathematician. Mathematics is full of cases like that, which is why I'm inclined to say evolution was the first blind mathematician. Blind because it did all that, but it didn't know, there wasn't any explicit knowledge that that was being done. It wasn't deliberate. Um, but the consequences of it were that if that capability was already there for the purposes that I've already mentioned, namely for allowing uh, variation during development of individuals, but also allowing creation of new species which are variants on old species without having to start from scratch with each new variant, perhaps at some point some new construction kit for inspecting control systems was also developed and that construction kit couldn't start investigating the patterns of the individual during learning and then drawing conclusions about how to intervene if possible. For instance, uh, allowing parents to have a fairly direct uh, uh, um, influence on the learning that their offspring do because the offspring are using the same pattern, that same general pattern that the parents have got, but the parents have already tailored that pattern in good ways to the environment they're in. And the environment in a savanna might be very different from an environment in, in um, uh, frozen waste and or environment or Rocky Mountain or whatever. So if the parent is able to discover how this generic pattern has been instantiated, then there might be procedures available for transferring that much more rapidly to offspring than the original process of discovering what instantiation of this general pattern works in this, in this environment. And a very special case of that could much later have been patterns of communication. Um, patterns of construction of information structures which are not just used internally but passed on to others. Um, <clears throat> in some sense I'm just repeating there stuff that probably lots of people believe about the evolution of language but I'm saying it's part of the evolution of mathematical competence as well and it may be part of the evolution of a whole variety of types of things which has details which we don't know and it may be that by trying to find out what those details are and what the mechanisms are that are used to make that work, we might be able to put more of that into our robots than we have at the moment and in ways that could make a huge difference. And I will end with one example of how that could, could be a difference. Apologies to people I've talked to about this previously. Um, there's now an awful lot of development in AI that's being based on use of so-called big data. There's lots of stuff on the internet and maybe in other large databases created by big companies, for instance, records of failures of various kinds of machinery or records of uh, how strategies of various sorts worked and didn't work. Um, and statistical techniques are being developed for finding these patterns and then constructing new instances that will deal with some situation or just replicate what the humans have done. Now, there are people who seem to think that that could be the basis of language learning that if you have a child growing up in a linguistic community, that child is collecting lots of data from the people who already speak the language and storing it, processing it, organizing it, 
And using genetic mechanisms, um, which find these patterns, developing abilities to extrapolate from the precise examples they've occurred and say new things, achieve new goals, and so on. Um, and you can actually get quite interesting and impressive demonstrations of machines that have learnt in that way and do things. For instance, they can, not in a language case, they can be taught to drive cars in a variety of situations by being trained on lots of patterns. But in the case of language learning, I think there's something deep that that misses, which is that human children do not do data mining in a database of adults or other expert users of language. They do something different, and there's indirect evidence for this and more direct evidence. The most spectacular example of direct evidence is what happened in a particular community. Some of you may already know the story. The deaf children in Nicaragua. Has anybody here heard about them? Okay. Sorry? Yeah. The, it's well known, or at one time became well known, that if deaf children are required to learn to lip read, they will not develop cognitively as well as they do if they're taught a sign language. There's a variety of reasons for this, and I don't know all the details. And at that time, there were many communities that tried to force their deaf, deaf community, or communities where there were deaf children, where they tried to force the children to learn to lip read, and they were being seriously deprived. So to deal with that, the Nicaraguan government, I think this was 30 or 40 years ago, decided to set up uh, a mechanism to teach deaf children to sign. And they had a few, not very many, uh, teachers, because there weren't all that many people in the country who had already learned to sign language. And kids were brought together and they were taught. And after a while, the things started happening that the teachers just couldn't understand. The kids were signing and laughing and apparently doing something like what happened when they were interacting with the teacher, but it was richer and there was a lot more of it when they were just doing it amongst themselves. And they brought in linguists and anthropologists and people from other places, MIT, etc., who studied what had happened. And it turned out that the children had uh, actually been able to feel or discover a need for a richer language than the one they were being taught, so they made one. They created this language. And I think if you actually look closely at normal children, you will find that that's what they're doing too. They are creating a language in a collaboration with all sorts of others, older siblings, parents, and so on, and then in a minority. So they're adjusting their creations to fit what, the, what will work. If you have twins, I'm told, they sometimes just invent their own language and, and use that in parallel with learning uh, or developing a language that fits the parents. Learning a second language can be a very different process. Um, if I went to learn French, I would not be able to create French. I would have to somehow learn the rules and internalize them. Anyway, if this is right, then what the children have is an abstraction which is not merely a pattern recognizer for taking in lots of data specifying the pattern and then generating more of that data. It's something much deeper and more powerful. It's a specification that they've got from their genome for creating something which can be a rich and powerful communicative device and perhaps also a thinking device and a planning device because language has many more uses than just communication with others. And furthermore, it's sort of obvious that it couldn't all have been acquired through data mining because once upon a time, there almost certainly were no human languages to mine. There weren't records, there weren't speakers. It at some point came out. So there had to be a creative process, and I suggest that the mechanisms that produce that creative process are still there, still working, but they are constantly accommodating with what's already being created by others. 
And so what looks like learning is partly learning, but much more a matter of creation. And if we had to make machines that could pick up languages in that way, they would come out very different from the current ones. Yes? Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, just thinking about this idea of pattern being in our brains, ready to go, and humans developing it to help with language and thinking and that sort of thing. Why, why don't you think we see it in other animals? Okay. You seem to be... I'm not saying it's a pattern in the language, really. To create a language. Yeah. Right. Why do we see it in other animals? Um, because it's a major engineering fe feat to produce such a thing. Um, in humans, it's got a lot of complicated software engineering features. For instance, children, uh, when they're doing this, they pick up lots of examples of what's being talked in the language. And they, when they're creating their own uh, version of it, they generalize beyond those patterns. But what they do at that point is create something with a uniform kind of grammar, which means that they then start saying things that are grammatically in the terms of what they've created from on the basis of data, but don't fit the language. So a child will say, Johnny hit at me and I run home, whereas two weeks ago they'd have said, Johnny hit me and I ran home. So they have to create that, and that means they have to add new software engineering to deal with irregularities in the rules uh, and so on. Now that wouldn't happen, so I'll hand you the thing in a minute, wouldn't happen for other kinds of things, which I think the same thing happens, where uh, instead of creating a uh, language, they create a theory about space and time and motion, or they create theories about types of mechanisms and what they can do. So I'm su I su suggest that this linguistic capability came after something more general developed, which had other uses, which I think you will find in some other species, but didn't have the extra uh, abilities to take in and store examples of linguistic communication. Now, some animals can learn a little bit of human language and respond to quite a lot of signals and, and, or even spoken words, but they just don't have necessarily got, they don't have that brain mechanism. Why not? doesn't seem to me to be a real question. If it had happened, I would want to know how did it happen. Okay, that is a question. There, so there, we would have to look back over the, the evolutionary tra trajectory and find out, I suspect that it only happened as a result of much uh, other complicated things producing forms of intelligence that allowed rich communication to provide huge benefits like collaborative construction of things where different people do different tasks and so on, or collaborative hunting. Other animals do collaborative hunting, but not with the same kind of division of labor as in humans. But, sorry, you wanted to add something? Yeah, according to Chomsky et al. 2002, the mechanism that people have in the brain is rec recursion, uh, which allows for generative language, uh, and th that's what's according to them, separates humans from animals. And it seems to be that all languages up to the point where you need recursion can be found in, in, in animals, while the point where you need recursion is, is uniquely human. And they, con and they ask in this paper, I don't know what has been done afterwards, but they ask in this paper whether you can find some recursion in animals, some generative abilities, maybe in one small domain, but at that point, I think still nobody has found anything of the sort. There's also research on animals in Vienna uh, on the birds where they try to find precisely which complexity of languages animals can recognize, and apparently they stop at uh, very simple, like those languages which can be recognized by finite automata. Well, you have provoked me to speculate about weaver birds. Those nests of very complicated structures. They're made of thousands of parts. The parts can come from different plants. They can vary quite a lot. So there's no way you can learn and pass on in your genes all the motions required to assemble a typical weaver bird nest. There'll be constant creative decision making at multiple stages during the process of constructing each nest where there's a new situation, where the new thing has to be brought in. And I suspect 
that they have something which may in some ways resemble the complexity and flexibility and generativity of a human language, but is highly specialized for that type of task. It's sort of language for generating nests as opposed to language for generating sentences. Uh, whether it's recursion as opposed to iteration or whatever, these are little details. But there may be quite a number of different cases like that amongst animals. And it, and it might have evolved in mammals. Uh, uh, the ability to do that sort of thing might have evolved in mammals. And then humans just took it a bit further in connection with forms of communication. But I suspect it was used internally before it was used externally. But that's another whole debate. So how are we doing for time? Very few minutes left. Well, I've left you, I've, I've given you a whole lot of, I won't say half-baked ideas. I must be more honest. Quarter or one-eighth baked ideas, which seem to me to add up to a very potentially powerful research program which could contribute to a whole variety of fields and bring them together and could make a huge difference to artificial intelligence and robotics and maybe to human education and, and developmental psychology and linguistics and various other things, psychotherapy. Um, but it's very difficult. Uh, most of the tasks are very ill-defined. Uh, most of the specification of the task is still at a very crude early stage. I mean, if you try reading my stuff, it's a mess. Um, and it's constantly being revised because I realized I had said something that was too imprecise, could be improved a bit, or then rejecting something because it was a dead end and so on. Uh, there's a bit that I'm still working on that speculates about where there might be a role for quantum mechanisms in some of the problem solving uh, processes that that might have been responsible for the development of kinds of visual, the speed and power of vision in, for instance, if you walk into a botanical center, the diversity of plants, the different kinds of regularities on tree trunks, on the patterns of leaves, the patterns of flowers, and so on. And while you walk around, within seconds, you're re building these things, even though you may never have seen these particular species before. It seems to me to require things that are nowhere near what, I mean, current AI vision research doesn't seem to be anywhere near being capable of explaining that. Now, just talking about quantum mechanics in itself doesn't say how that might, but I think there might be a kind of abstraction which can come down, be instantiated in all those different ways, which involves a lot of parallel problem solving. And uh, who knows? <laughs> You've been no, inspired. I, I... It, it is somehow puzzling to think about a abstraction mechanism when we think about nature and evolution. And uh, so I was wondering how you figure something like that out, what this abstraction is. And uh, according to your explanation, it would, it would have to be something like evolution according to possibilities and impossibilities or something. And removing some structure from a thing that works and replacing the roof things with places that can be filled by different instances. So then you can get different instances of that pattern. And there seems to be something in there in the way the genome works, but probably most of it not yet understood. OK. <laughs> but we know how to do it with programs. I mean, I don't believe any human being 200 years ago could have had these thoughts that I'm communicating to you. I spent the last. 40 years of my life learning all kinds of things that weren't being taught when I was at school from software engineers, AI researchers, linguists, and so on. And um, that may just be scratching the surface. We may only have found a tiny subset of what's important. You're going to say something else? No, no, anyway. Okay. okay. All right. Anyway, um, uh, Ben is going to be giving a talk in half an hour. And um, I'm, I think we, knew, we need to stop in three minutes. So uh, having made my apology for the mess, and uh, invite anybody who has any thoughts or ideas by looking at the web page and wants to write to me and so on, I'd be grateful for comments, criticism, suggestions, flaws. But if anyone would like to add anything now, we've got time for a few short comments or one long one.
No. You're all speechless. <laughs> I failed or maybe succeeded. I don't know. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, one last thing. Sorry. One last thing. Uh, when I came in, there was a thing on the board that some of you would have seen. The, uh, the um, summer school has a tour tomorrow. And uh, I recommend that you all go on it. I'm sure it'll be great, a tour of Edinburgh. But I'm not going, partly because uh, I'd rather meet and talk people, but partly also I know I will hold up all the energetic, healthy youngsters if I go on the tour. So I've got a room booked, and I'm just going to be there. And if anybody wants to come and talk about any of this, room 116, it's one level up on the other side. And I'll be there from about 2.30. Uh, the tour goes at about 3. And uh, if nobody comes, I've got lots of work to do. If anyone wants to come, be delighted to talk about anything. I mean, you can tell me your research and why I should be interested in it. I'd be happy to do that. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.